Good afternoon, and thank you again for joining NSBA for our webinar on protecting your small businesses online. My name is Molly Day, and I'm the VP for Public Affairs here at NSBA, and I'll be running the webinar today. I'm happy now to turn it over to NSBA President Todd McCracken, who will serve as our moderator. Todd? Be here. Uh, uh, and I want to add a special thanks to all of our active NSBA members across the country who uh, who are taking the time to join us today. It's the beginning of Cybersecurity Month. Uh, the whole month of October is dedicated to, to raising awareness about cybersecurity, and we're happy to do our part today. But we're especially pleased about the great lineup of guests we have speaking to you all today. Uh, we have some really top-tier experts with a, not only a wealth of information, but a breadth of information on all kinds of different aspects of, of uh, not just cybersecurity, but the evolving cyber world. Uh, uh, looking forward and how small businesses uh, can take advantage of it and what some of the greatest uh, threats and opportunities are. Um, uh, we're going to start off today's call a hearing from Greg Osanoff, who is the CEO and founder of Osanoff Group and, and uh, Survive Cyber, who will provide a kind of a big picture overview of cyber threats and trends in 2019 and 2020. And then uh, Rebecca Harold will, will talk to us. Uh, she's the CEO of the Privacy Professor, and uh, she's going to get into some of the security uh, details and risks posed by computer chip uh, uh, defaults and other problems with computer chips. That is an issue that needs a lot more awareness out there. And then finally, Alan Pence, uh, who is CEO and founder of Core Alliance, is going to talk to us about about 5G, there's a lot of misunderstanding and, and, and some level of lack of awareness about what 5G will mean, how it will get rolled out, and how small businesses are going to be impacted in the future. So uh, that's a lot to cover in an hour, so I'm going to keep my remarks uh, uh, brief here. I just have a few more uh, uh, kind of housekeeping rules I want to go over with people before we start our speakers. Uh, first, because of the number of people on the line, everybody's going to be muted to start off with. Um, but we are going to try to make time to take some questions at the end. So uh, to ask a question when it is Q&A time, you have a handful of options. You can either use the menu bar at the bottom of the screen if you're on your computer to raise your hand. And then Molly, uh, will, who will moderate, uh, can unmute your line and allow you to ask the question. Uh, if you prefer not to be recognized personally, but you want to ask your question, uh, you can click the Q&A button on the bottom menu bar and type in your question. And then using the Q&A functionality, you do not need to wait to type in your questions. You can just type them in whenever they come to you, and we will address them uh, to the extent we have time at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you aren't joining us via the webinar platform, you can email questions uh, to Molly at mday, that's M-D-A-Y, at N-S-B-A dot biz, B-I-Z. Um, we will not address questions after each panel has spoken, and we will do them all at the end. So either raise your hand or, or use the Q&A buttons. Uh, please keep your questions brief and relative to the issue at hand. We will make every effort to answer those questions, but we intend to end the call by two uh, and allow you to have the balance of your afternoon. And now I'm going to turn it over to our speakers, the first being uh, Greg Osanoff, who will be giving us the lowdown on cybersecurity and what you need to know in the near term. Greg, thanks for being here. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for having us today. Um, Molly, next uh, slide, please. So how many of us here have said, uh, this will never happen to me, or I'm willing to take the risk? In my travels through the SMB community, advising companies around cybersecurity, <clears throat> unfortunately, those comments are more prevalent than I would like. Um, unfortunately, the stakes for small businesses are high, and the risk is real. Uh, some of the facts that I like to really highlight so that uh, they can get their management team motivated uh, to take uh, cybersecurity uh, seriously and as one of their high uh, priorities for 2019 is the fact that over 60% of all cyber attacks were targeted against companies that have less than 100 employees. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense from a bad actor perspective, right? Uh, they're looking for path of least resistance. We as the small business communities often have limited time, limited budgets, uh, limited technical expertise. So they see it as an opportunity uh, that is maybe easier than going after a Fortune 500. 
But I think most concerning to me is uh, the trend towards companies going out of business because they've been impacted by a significant incident. Over 60% of small businesses that have had a significant incident uh, are estimated to go out of business. And in fact, I recently did a study where, where what we're seeing is the compression of time between the discovery of that incident and the company going out of business is actually going, uh, is compressing. So it's a significant issue. Next slide. Oftentimes, small businesses think that they don't have any data that's of value or that they just because they've moved data into the Amazon cloud uh, or they're using Office 365 in the Microsoft <coughs> environment, um, that they have nothing to worry about. Unfortunately, that's not the case. If you think about what a bad actor would value in your organization, you need to take stock of all the data that you're uh, storing, whether it is intellectual property information, whether it is a sensitive internal memo around your strategic pricing or acquisition of a, a customer, whether it's uh, personnel information or third-party vendor partnership information, uh, your financial information, your HR, all of which has significant value uh, to a customer. And just to put a dollar sign on that, so last year, uh, the average cost to a corporation when the losing data was $242 per file. So as you can imagine, if they take data of any significance, that could add up. In fact, 20% of small to mid-sized businesses, under 500 employees, reported last year that they had over a million dollars in costs associated with a cyber breach. So the stakes are high and you can see how it could really impact your organization. Next slide. So the type of incidents, and also more importantly maybe, is the time that you it takes your organization to discover the incident and remediate has also a major impact on cost. So not only is there economic value to bad guys around files that your organizations are creating, um, but how quickly you're able to identify and respond uh, raises the stakes. In fact, a recent study showed that if you can reduce the time to less than 200 days uh, by identifying and remediating, uh, you're likely to reduce the cost and impact of a breach by two thirds. Um, and that sounds like a big number. However, it's not. Unfortunately, the average time um, to identification and remediation is 279 days. So it's not rare for a bad actor to be in your network compromising your business um, and um, uh, impacting your company. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the trends of 2019-2020. Um, these are areas in my mind that you should be aware of, uh, you should be thinking about. The good news is in an uh, upcoming slide, there are some fairly inexpensive um, and smart strategies to address some of this risk. Uh, but the first is around employee education. So the majority of data breaches generally start from a compromised employee. Whether that employee has bad motives uh, or simply made a mistake, uh, there is a significant point of weakness. Uh, it's absolutely critical that you think about creating a culture of security, which is reinforced by your management team uh, and it's shown to the organization that you take it seriously. Um, that culture of security should include, obviously, policies and procedures, uh, but ongoing training, uh, testing of your organization uh, to make sure that your employees understand what their requirements are, helping them identify what potential risks are, et cetera. Password protection. Again, a fairly inexpensive solution to a real big problem. Uh, if you don't already have some password management, both in policy and technology implementation, consider doing that. Um, studies have shown that organizations with strong password management strategies significantly reduce their overall cyber risk. Uh, and those have to be enforced, not just simply created. Obviously, we've all heard about ransomware. That continues to be a major problem. In fact, that's probably the primary risk to small businesses today. What is ransomware? It's nothing more than viruses which are deployed onto your systems and essentially encrypt 
uh, sensitive information, and the only way you could access that information is by getting a encryption key from the bad actor, uh, which generally will cost you, uh, you know, some kind of ransom. Unfortunately for all of us, it's an arms race. Uh, today on the on the dark web, uh, it's very in, uh, inexpensive to access really sophisticated attack kits. Uh, it's very affordable for bad actors to deploy, um, and it's a constant race between um, defending and creating. Cryptocurrency, uh, crypto mining is uh, fairly new, but it's rapidly growing in pace uh, ever since the cryptocurrencies have gained value. So oftentimes bad actors now are making economic decisions on whether to deploy ransomware or just simply take over your, your uh, systems and use your computer power to mine for cryptocurrency. And it's really interesting because it basically fluctuates the use and deployment of it based on the value of the cryptocurrencies out there. Uh, social media. So this one's insidious and it's difficult to deal with, um, but it can significantly damage your reputation and it can also impact your overall security uh, strategies. Uh, what this is, is with ever gaining sophistication, uh, bad actors are able to create social media um, presence that looks like it's you. It could damage your reputation or it can be used to get employees or third parties or customers uh, to slowly disclose information which then can be used to compromise other accounts. So it's important to monitor what's going on on the internet uh, as it relates to your organization. Artificial intelligence, it's on kind of the cutting edge, but it's happening really fast. For those of you that are not familiar, there's a new wave of technology called deep fake videos uh, that is really concerning on many levels. Uh, but essentially what the technology now is allowing us to do is to take a small little picture of somebody, a little piece of their voice recording, and create full motion video of saying and doing whatever it is you want with almost no way to detect it. Imagine the power of being able to use something like that to open a bank account, uh, to move assets, et cetera. Another big challenge that you need to think about is the Internet of Things. Uh, that is growing exponentially, much faster than actually your IT assets, right? So today, without any thought, uh, people are putting uh, intelligence and network ability into devices, whether that's your thermostat, whether that's your printer, whether that's your LED lighting system, and all of which are being plugged in and connecting and talking to your networks, which gives you, uh, which gives bad actors obviously a new route uh, to compromise parts of your system. The other challenge that I think you have is oftentimes it's overlooked, right? Nobody really owns in an organization security around uh, Internet of Things. So you need to give some thought to, okay, who owns that liability within my organization? What are we connecting to each other? Is it absolutely critical that it is connected? Um, and then if it is, um, how do we protect against it? And then finally, bring your own device, B-Y-O-D. Bring your own device has obviously been a trend over the last 10 years, uh, but more and more your employees are merging their personal devices with their business use. The commingling of that information obviously creates security risks, right, and leaves you open to vulnerabilities. Similar to IoT, uh, you need to give some thought to um, who owns that liability and how are you going to manage it. Okay, Molly, thanks. Next one. Okay, so the next two slides just give you some, you know, real tangible things that tomorrow you could go back to the office and you could begin thinking about. They do not cost a lot to do, um, but man, oh man, will they increase, uh, rather reduce your, your cybersecurity risk. So the first thing is to assess. What you need to do is think about where all your data resides and what is the value of each of those data pools. And once you've identified that, creating a data map, you then assign who needs within your organization to access that data, right? Probably your um, sales force does not need to access your financial information. Likewise, your HR department probably doesn't need to gain access to your uh, contact management software. Um, so you need to think a little bit about that. Uh, where is it residing? Who needs access to it? And how can we create controls to limit the amount of people within our organization 
that will see that information. Uh, invest in a security plan. Document, document, document. Create the security plan and then implement it uh, with the next point through an education and creating a culture of security. You don't want to create a security plan or an incident response plan after an emergency has happened. Um, but it's really critical that you think through these things. Now, there's a lot of information that's available either through vendors that are supporting you on the internet and the like uh, that can be a starting point. Um, so these don't have to be daunting um, uh, tasks. With regards to educating employees, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but it's absolutely critical that you figure out a way to show the employees that you're serious about security that it's absolutely critical to the success and survival of your organization. Um, and it's only fair that if you're serious about it, you're going to test and you're going to retrain uh, and you're going to constantly uh, give them the tools and education they need uh, in order to um, be successful. One of the areas that you may want to consider is what's known as a phishing test, which is um, you know, a vendor that will actually do a simulated uh, ransomware attack to see who will accidentally click on attachments or fall prey to schemes. And then you can use that information to figure out where your organization is and also obviously approach the individuals to, to help them um, get up to speed on where they need to be uh, from an awareness perspective. Okay, Molly? Thanks, Greg. Uh, okay. there's, yes. there's a lot there, obviously, but thank you very much for that, uh, that overview. Um, and I just want to remind members, you've probably seen some information about this already, but NSBA just launched a partnership with uh, uh, Survive Cyber, where members have access to affordable cyber risk protection platform, uh, including access to U.S. government-backed legal protections against breach-related lawsuits and regulatory fines and other timely cyber threat alerts to help reduce your exposure. Um, so please look into that. Uh, the next issue. Yeah, and in something. fact, there's, a, there's there's data available to you in that membership. So a lot of the incident response planning is already created. Um, so you have access to you know a wealth of uh, library of data that will uh, kind of talk to these issues. Yeah, that's why you're so impressed. It puts you puts you people uh, several steps ahead of the game for sure, uh, or leaps and bounds actually. Um, and then now the next issue we're talking about a little bit is one that uh, we've only really began digging into in a significant way the last few months. And uh, there's, there's some really worrying information there for, for companies. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, many computer chips contain structural defects um, uh, in the processors, and they've created an opening for hackers in many cases. While there are updates and patches for those to address those issues, those patches in turn create other other performance issues and other problems and cost small businesses money and time. Um, so uh, we've invited, since there's really relatively low awareness about this we find in the small business community, we've invited uh, Rebecca Harrell here uh, to give us some more details on those flaws, what you can do about it, what questions you should ask, and what your next steps might should be. Uh, Rebecca, thanks for being here. Will you uh, illuminate us a little bit on this issue? Maybe Rebecca's still muted. Sorry about that, Rebecca. You should be good to go now. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much, Todd. You know, I'm very happy to speak with all of you today about this very important topic. And, and as you mentioned, too few still know about it, and it's something that could have a significant impact, especially on small businesses with regard to not only increased possibilities of privacy breaches and security incidents, but also potentially significant impacts to your business processing. And since today is the first day of National Computer Security Awareness Month, it's very apropos. So let's dive right into this topic of computer processor chip security flaws. Next slide, please. So it's important to understand, I've, I've had a lot of small businesses ask me, well, why are we even in this situation today of all this high tech? Well, you know what? The root cause lies in actions and decisions that were actually taken over 25 years ago. So think back to the early 1990s. The problem is that when the engineers designed these chips, it was at a time where there were no IoT types of devices, no smartphones, 
virtually a very little, no internet or peer-to-peer -peer connectivity. So their processor chip designs did not consider that there would be always connected to network types of connections to computing devices. And it wasn't even imagined then that someone outside of the network could get into such devices directly. The engineers saw and assumed that networks had firewalls to any outside connections. So those chips were not built with strong security controls. And as time went on, the processor chips generally continued to be manufactured and built in the same way, even though computing technologies and networks and the way to access them and, and the internet and, and the other types of computing devices that we've come to use just every day and the computing environment in general, it evolved and it dramatically changed. So it was only recently when security researchers decided to look at the current security issues related to these comparatively long ago designed processors that these existing security vulnerabilities were discovered, and so security flaws were found. So there's a lot of misinformation out there, and I want to provide you with some understanding about the different types of chip defects and those who are affected. Quite generally, the AR uh, the ARM chips are used in most low processing types of computing devices, such as the smart devices and the smartphones that we all use. IBM power chips are quite generally within the higher power servers used by large organizations and often for private cloud computing. And the system Z chips are used usually within large high powered mainframes. Now Intel and AMD chips are generally found in most of the types of computing devices such as desktops, servers, laptops, along with smartphones and IoT devices and peer-to-peer -peer devices that small businesses use and depend upon. Intel chips are within the types of computers that are used overwhelmingly by the largest percentage of small businesses. That's estimated to be right around the 80 to 82 percent uh, range. And since mostly Intel chips and one type of ARM chip and some AMD chips are where the security flaws that have been widely publicized are found, I'm going to uh, focus on those today. So here's a quick tip. You can identify the type of processor chip within your small business computing device, approximately 93% of which are Windows computers. So if you're on a Windows machine, press the Windows key and pause key at the same time. A system window is going to open, which will show you the type of processor that you have inside. In most Apple computers, you can see the type of processor chip you're using by clicking the Apple icon in the upper left corner of your screen. And from the the drop down menu, click about this Mac, and that will also show you the type of processor chip that's inside. And FYI, virtually all the Apple computers are running Intel chips. So what major vulnerabilities impact the processor chips used by most small businesses? Well, first let's look at and consider the Spectre vulnerability. It was first announced in January of 2018 and it impacts practically every computer and server on the planet. Now the vulnerability here is that the processor does not remove or delete certain content from the processor chip after it's no longer needed. While researchers have identified this as a vulnerability, it does take some in-depth technology understanding to exploit this vulnerability and it has to be under just the right circumstances. So it is fortunately hard for most hackers to execute and exploit Spectre. Now let's look at Meltdown. The Meltdown vulnerability, it was also first announced in January of 2018. And it's a vulnerability found overwhelmingly within Intel chips, although there is one ARM chip that has been determined by research to also be vulnerable to one of several Meltdown variants. Now Meltdown allows for unauthorized access to protected data. It's also easy to exploit compared to the Spectre vulnerability. And since these original vulnerabilities were discovered, there have been at least five more exploits discovered specific to 
the Intel processor chips. These include such uh, exploits as Foreshadow and Zombie Load, RIDL, Fallout, and SwapGS. And a new significant security vulnerability was reported just a week or so ago, Netcat, and it actually allows for network traffic sniffing through Intel chips. Next slide, please. So what are the risks? Well, not only can hackers and other unauthorized folks access sensitive information, such as what you see listed here, but they can also do such things as execute code and commands, and they can access applications and possibly make changes in the code, and they can also access privileged data and personal data and more. When the chips are not completely re-engineered, it is simply a fact that more exploits will continue to be found over time as researchers have more time to find them. And of course, as new types of devices use the chips and as new types of applications are used involving the flawed chips. Next slide, please. So another big risk is that there's no trail left when these vulnerabilities are exploited. Considering the types of data that you just saw that are located in the areas where these vulnerabilities are located, especially by the meltdown vulnerability and the overwhelmingly large percentage of businesses using those Intel chips, it is a significant concern. The data located in memory is very sensitive and it contains a large amount of personal data. So imagine if a cyber crook is exploiting your flawed Intel chips to siphon those data items from your computers. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know until after the data was stolen and used for fraud or some other types of crimes. And then at that point in time, that's when it would ultimately be traced back to your business. Ultimately, there seems to be a, a perception that all of the different types of vulnerabilities impact all types of processor chips, when in fact, only Spectre is a vulnerability that does go across all the different types of chips I mentioned before. Meltdown is primarily a problem with the Intel chips and it is the vulnerability that, that researchers have determined to be most easily exploited. And because of these significant risks, huge companies are actually moving away from Intel chips and, and switching to the AMD processor chips. Some of these include giants such as Google and Twitter and Microsoft. A popular online tech site called Tom's Hardware, and I encourage you to check that out if you haven't seen it before, they actually commented about Google moving away from the Intel chips saying, well, who can blame them? <laughs> well, with the big tech companies moving from the Intel chips to other processor chips, it is convincing evidence that the riskiest chip exploits are with the meltdown, which um, is impacting mostly the Intel chips. Now, these organizations wouldn't be taking such drastic moves to replace their hardware if it wasn't such a significant risk. Next slide, please. Uh, consider all the types of computing devices you use within your business. Many times folks don't realize that their copy machines and their printers and fax machines and other devices, these do contain computers. And that the overwhelming majority, as mentioned before, 80 to 82 percent are using the types of Intel chips that contain these more easily exploitable flaws that I was describing earlier. So consider, do you have an inventory of all of your computing devices that you use within your business? Do you include in that inventory devices owned by your employees and your contractors who work away from your office? Well, if you don't, now's the time to create one and maintain it. Next slide, please. Now, basically all small businesses are impacted because the types of computing devices they use contain Intel and AMD and ARM chips that have at least one of these flaws. And again, since we talked about the fact that 80, up to 82% of the different types of computing devices contain the Intel, which is more risky, then that's something for you to consider as well and to check out whether or not you have uh, the Intel chips within your particular devices in your business uh, environment. 
Now, this presents many challenges to small businesses, including those listed here. Exploits are um, a major problem for small businesses. You know, how are you going to identify the computing devices within your environment? And how are you going to decide what to do to mitigate the risks within the devices at most risk? And what are you going to do to address the negative impacts on computing performance within small business network? You know, downloaded software fixes can significantly slow the performance of your business computers, and there will be some increased costs to add protection to the systems or replace hardware. And I'm going to describe those on the next couple of slides. So consider, what would your small business do to recover from a security incident or privacy breach where sensitive data was obtained through one of these um, flawed chips within your business processing environment? So next slide. So what do you do? Well, as I mentioned earlier, first identify and document your business computing devices. Then to make this a manageable project, determine which of those devices are mission critical to your business that you depend upon for your business and start with those. Now, don't forget to go back though and take these same actions on the other devices after you get the mission critical ones taken care of. Now, many folks, many advisors uh, say you should download the operating system uh, patches and the other types of processor chip patches uh, to fix the flaws as soon as possible. But I do want to make sure you know that there will be probably an impact to doing this. Otherwise, you might get a rude awakening afterwards when you do notice response time and processing times slow down. Um, if they do. So you need to also take that into consideration. Downloadable patches for the processor chip flaws exist, but based upon real world experiences, applying them may result in your business taking some type of performance hit. Many small businesses don't operate, quite frankly, with the latest and greatest technology. And so oftentimes they haven't applied any patches to their operating systems, which means if their security is compromised or if they apply a chip flaw patch, they are more likely to see a significant performance hit than with the newer systems, which will experience um, that hit if they apply those patches that are available. So think about when you've last downloaded the patches within your business environment. In fact, Microsoft warned that the software fixes for Meltdown and Spectre vulnerabilities actually could significantly impact the performance of the systems. Now, if you're using Windows 10 systems with newer chips, the slowdowns would probably be very small, but with Windows 10 devices using the older chips and those of you using older versions of Windows systems, you'll probably be more likely to see more significant slowdowns and a noticeable decrease in system performance. Now, some IT professionals who downloaded patches for devices with Intel chips, they actually reported experiencing significant performance hits uh, findings from the login BSI survey, which 200 IT professionals took, actually showed a range of up to 10%, 15%, or even more than 20% had noticeable performance degradation when they applied those chip fixes. So keep that in mind. And speaking of performance, it's, it's also worth pointing out that the patches for the AMD chips that address the specter risk, those have not to date been found to slow down computing. So that's good. If you have AMD chips, then that's a good thing for you. Um, so that's something to keep in mind and also just know that there have been uh, reductions of 20 to 30% in processing speeds after downloading the chip uh, patches for the Intel flaw. And something that folks were completely surprised by was the significant increase in electricity costs, uh, such as those that, ex that were experienced by a server engineer who described it in this yellow box that you see on the screen in front of you. Can you imagine you download 
a fix and all of a sudden your electricity costs go up $140 a month. So just keep in mind that that extra processing does cause um, extra electricity usage too, depending upon how uh, severe the situation is within your processing environment. And also something else to consider, I mentioned earlier, the patches are addressing the known vulnerabilities. So as additional vulnerabilities are discovered, you will still be vulnerable to those. So as highlighted in the headline clipping shown. Uh, next slide, please. Now, there may also be additional financial costs of implementing the flawed Intel chip patches, such as upgrading the need to upgrade your systems and hardware and adding servers to offset those performance hits that you experienced from the patches and so on. So it's important before you, you just go and take action right away that you keep all these factors in mind uh, when you're considering downloading the patches for specifically known vulnerability in your processor chips. And when taking all things into consideration, most organizations that are taking actions are typically downloading the patches for the AMD chips where the in the wild exploits have not yet been reported and then the larger organizations and likely a growing number of mid-sized organizations are choosing to make hardware changes um, replacing the Intel chips oftentimes with the new AMD chips. So all these considerations need to be looked at and every business of course as Greg mentioned earlier needs to implement policies and procedures to configure and automatically download patches as they become available to keep your operating systems not just the chips and all the other vulnerabilities that will continue to be discovered to keep them updated on an ongoing basis and then of course again as was uh, mentioned earlier provide regular training, make sure your employees and contractors know to keep their systems updated as well. Not only is it necessary to protect your business and prevent breaches and security incidents, but also know that it's necessary to meet risk management requirements for a growing number of laws and regulations and even contractual requirements. Next slide, please. And if any of you have questions about these topics or want links to those reference surveys, here are some of the ways you can get in touch with me. And of course, as you can probably tell, I could go on and on about this, but um, this concludes at this point in time my portion of today's webinar. I'm happy to answer whatever questions you might have during the Q&A. Now back over to you, Todd. Thanks so much, Rebecca. That was really in front of There's a lot there, obviously. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, we'll be sending out the uh, a link to the full webinar to everyone who participated today uh, later this afternoon so that uh, if something flew past you, you can listen again, you can watch the presentations again or, or, or whatever you would like. But uh, uh, this is one of those issues that is so frustrating for small companies because uh, small business owners, because it's it's both really technical, but also really important, but it's also kind of hidden and, and relatively unknown. So we really thank you for your efforts to bring this to light and give us some tips and pointers on, on what to do. Um, uh, uh, and, and that same vein, NSBA has also launched our own sort of resource center that gets to some of those issues as well that people might want to visit. It's at uh, nsba.biz backslash chip dash defect. Um, and there's a lot more details there as well. Um, uh, we'll, we'll put that in the email to people as well when it goes out. Uh, now I, I want to switch gears a little bit uh, and and talk about the rollout of a 5G network. I'm sure a lot of you have been hearing a lot about 5G for quite a while. Higher speeds, more improved computing, uh, greater ability to do all kinds of things. Sounds like a great thing, right? And, and it probably will be for many, many people. But there are also some big issues uh, coming our way around that, uh, both for its rollout uh, and also for uh, uh, how to make sure that there's a, uh, uh, an equitable rollout of, of 5G for companies across the country. Um, infrastructure, uh, growing the network, etc. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned before, Alan Pence uh, with the Corner Alliance uh, has shown up to sort of give us some thoughts about that um, and what we can expect. So, for an overview of 5G, uh, Alan Pence, thanks for being here. Excellent. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate it. <clears throat> so, I'm here to tell you about how, like, all that stuff we just heard about is going to get a lot worse. Um, so, and we'll we'll kind of talk about this from the 5G perspective. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so 
So what is 5G? I always say that it's, it's one more G. We have 4G now and we're getting to 5G. So really what, really what we're looking at though is, um, as Todd mentioned, exponential increases in speed and um, reductions in latency. So that's how long it takes, you know, the little spinning wheel to, to register your, um, your request from the network. Um, and we're gonna see 10 to 100 times increases in speed and huge reductions in latency. And as a result, um, we are gonna have um, new kinds of applications that most of us have never even dreamed of before, right? So 4G got us stuff like Uber and Netflix and all the other apps that we're using on our phone. What we're gonna be looking at for 5G, again, it's not really out, but people are speculating driverless cars and autonomous vehicles and things like augmented reality when you walk past a retail shop. Um, showing you, you know, what you could be wearing or buying or, or those types of things. And then a whole bunch of things that no one's even dreamed of yet, right? So very quickly, we're going to see a bunch of entrepreneurs like us innovating on top of the, of the network and creating all new kinds of applications. So actually to the conversation we were just having, cybersecurity is going to be a nightmare um, because this will go so fast and the business case is so strong. Um, we're going to probably plunge into a lot of these applications without the, the correct cyber protection. So um, that is going to be a huge issue. And again, I think, I think we're all going to have to be careful about that. But in addition, um, the way 5G is constructed, it's all about using shorter, um, shorter hop, um, higher spectrum bands. So like your cell phone works in 700 megahertz, your Wi-Fi is at 2.4 or 5 gigahertz. We're talking about using things that they call, they call it the millimeter wave up in 30 to 50 gigahertz, right? So they go very short distances. And as a result, you have to put in a lot of antennas, a lot of things to hop the signal back. And that's going to allow, but using all that extra spectrum is going to allow all these additional devices like sensors and all this kind of stuff to operate um, in, in uh, smaller areas. So what that leads to though is the architecture of it is a very dense network. So that favors dense urban areas. Um, and as the network is deployed, you're gonna see places on the coast and with a few exceptions, Chicago and Austin, Dallas and those kind of places, the major cities are gonna get most of the build out right away. Um, and I think a significant issue for small business is making sure that the build out happens in the second tier cities and then eventually in, in suburban and rural areas as well. So I think there's a huge parity issue there. That also plays into another issue around regulation. So cities and loca localities uh, obviously want to regulate how carriers rip up their streets um, and their contractors rip up the streets. I think we have to be a strong voice to make sure that obviously there are legitimate local concerns, but it can't also be a blackmail scheme to get more fee money out of the, the carriers and we need this to go expeditiously because what's going to happen is very quickly when the big cities get it, we're going to start getting new economic models built on top of 5G. So that store, you may, if you're a retail owner, there might be, a, if you're in New York City or Washington, D.C. or California, you might have the ability to have people try on clothes virtually, like while they're walking by, or identify somebody off of their cell phone with a sensor in your store and have all sorts of new marketing opportunities. So that obviously is going to catapult you into a different economic class. Um, and if other cities don't have access to that, those, those retail uh, locations are going to suffer. Um, additionally, autonomous vehicles. If there's not enough density, uh, certain areas just won't be able to get access to that kind of innovation. And I think when we're seeing speeds go really 100 times more, um, it's not like in 4G, maybe if you're in a, a lower density area, your Netflix would be a little blurry. There's just not going to be any Netflix for you in 5G. So I think it's absolutely crucial that small businesses have access to those sorts of um, applications. 
then I think the other thing that we as small businesses really need to be doing is thinking through the, and becoming aware and keeping track of where the technology trends are going. So it's a lot of this stuff is going to come to the large business first. And for us to keep parity, we need to keep educated and make ourselves aware of exactly what's happening and the new things that 5G is going to bring to our businesses. And those models are going to happen very quickly. So that, so there's things that are going to benefit your business. And then on the other side, think about how much Uber disrupted taxis and open table and others started disrupting restaurants. And now we see Uber eats is a huge problem taking massive amounts of restaurant profits. Um, that's just going to go, that's going to go a hundred times what it, what it's already been. So we as small businesses need to be very smart and very aware of the competition and the disruption that's going to happen because of 5G. I think it's really time for all of us to get educated and we're going to have to respond very quickly um, as businesses. So really I see um, just as this is more of just an overview. We've just started talking about this issue uh, with NSBA, uh, but we're definitely looking to work with people um, across the association and kind of get um, a program going where we can help educate members and then deal with a couple of these regulatory issues and make sure that there's parity um, between cities and that the small businesses community, community's voice is um, in the discussion here. Um, so that's really it for today. And I appreciate your time. Well, thanks a lot, Alan. Thanks for being here. And uh, uh, thanks for helping get us up to speed on this. Um, as you mentioned, this is definitely an issue that the NSBA is, con is committed really to working on and broadening our ability to have an impact on in a way that really helps the smaller business community. So, all right, so uh, we've heard from all our speakers now um, and we're gonna open this up to a little bit of Q&A. Um, again, all the caller, or, excuse me, all the participants currently are muted, but if you wanna ask a question, just to, just to remind, there are three, uh, three options. You can use, if you're on your computer, you can use the menu bar at the bottom of the screen to raise your hand. Uh, and then Molly, who's gonna moderate the Q&A, uh, we'll unmute your line so that you can answer your question. If you don't want to be recognized, you can click the Q&A button on the bottom of the bar menu and just type in your question, and then we can ask it ourselves. Uh, and if you aren't joining uh, on the webinar platform, uh, you can email questions to uh, Molly at mday, M-D-A-Y, at nsba.biz. All right. Hey, Todd, so, uh, hey, yes, Todd I have a question for Greg. <laughs> Is that all right? Uh, sure. So, Greg, I was wondering, you were talking about ransomware. If you are using, you know, like Outlook 365 or G Suite, um, do you need some kind of other backup service or something like that to, to um, yeah. stay secure? So, you, yeah, I mean, I think you have two risks when you're dealing with, uh, especially with Google Suite. Uh, the first is the fact that uh, they have a huge amount of third-party apps that run within their uh, their ecosystem and environment. I, I seem to recall, I think it was Kaspersky, I could be wrong, but I think they did an audit uh, last year and they found something like 60,000 Trojan horses in those apps, right? So that's the first challenge you have in terms of being susceptible to ransomware in the, in the Google suite. The other is when you use either their backup or their syncing function, right? So imagine that you're syncing, which means that you're able to work offline on your computer, you infect by accident uh, one of your files, which then gets moved back up into the cloud, um, and you've got an issue there. Um, so my recommendation, and it's not the, the, the end all, is to think about um, having a third-party backup system uh, as opposed to just that one ecosystem. Um, and, and that's probably a good place to start. But, but remember, to me, ransomware and malware is you should be focusing more on prevention, uh, which is around, you know, employee education, uh, not clicking on the wrong things. You're probably, uh, um, you know, better off focusing on the prevention than the, the, than the rehabilitation. And if I could offer a few thoughts related to that, too, I think having a very good backup um, procedure is so important. I mean, personally, I found with so many of my small business clients, I advise them to make frequent backups and keep some locally, meaning have some on a local hard drive uh, that's not 
connected to your network when uh, you aren't actually doing the backup. The more backups you can have, the least likely if you do get hit by ransomware that you'll have to pay the ransom because you have all your data. So uh, that's something else. Well, one more thing on that is actually there's a very high percentage of failure in backups. So also test it before the emergency. Oh, of course. And that goes to your uh, policies and procedures that we, we were talking about earlier. Well, this is Molly. I'm going to hop in here. We've got a number of questions that have come through the Q&A pa panel. So let me turn to those really quick first. And this is kind of along the lines of what y'all were just talking about. This is from Gary Kushner. He asks, how successful has the No More Ransomware project been in unlocking ransomware without paying? Do you want me to take that, guys? I'll give you my, my general thoughts. So for those that don't know, that is... Uh, um, it's a consortium of private entities and law enforcement started in Europe, uh, essentially dedicating tools to the collective effort. Um, and so what it's designed to do is after the fact, if in fact you are a victim of uh, some kind of ransomware, you can actually upload components of the code uh, and determine whether there are decryption kits available within there. And, uh, you know, all of the major antivirus companies do um, uh, offer some tools into the system, some more than others. The one area that we are concerned about for companies that are dealing with the federal government uh, is the fact that Kaspersky is involved pretty heavily there. Um, and you may or may not know, but Kaspersky uh, has been banned uh, on essentially all federal systems. Um, so you want to be aware of who is uh, providing some of those tools, uh, but absolutely is probably one of the most effective after the fact tools um, that you have available in your arsenal. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn over to, I've got a raised hand here, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute your line. I believe this is Sharon Torek. If you'd like to go ahead and answer your question, uh, or excuse me, ask your question. Thank you, Molly. Uh, I want to thank all the presenters today. It's been an awesome um, set of presentations and great takeaways. I wanted to ask um, Greg and Rebecca for their thoughts about sort of the business transaction implications of all this, because while we're all as small business owners certainly concerned about um, the cost or um, the business interruption caused by, you know, a ransomware attack or a bad chip that could lead to a data leak. Um, what I think we're spending less time thinking about is what this could mean as we're negotiating business transactions, either with our vendors or our clients, and how the parties might be talking about shifting liability um, between one another for some of these issues um, in case something goes wrong and a client's data is compromised, for example, um, or lost. And so I wondered if you could share some of your thoughts about how small business owners need to be thinking about and preparing for um, conducting their um, business negotiations and their um, transactions with these concerns in mind. Well, I can offer a few thoughts. Um, I love your question, and it uh, involves a lot of complexity and many different factors. But I think with regard to your uh, part about the vendors, it's so important that you do um, strong vendor vetting before you actually entrust vendors to take hold of your data and your systems and do your processing for you. So you need to include when you're when you're trying to think about who you're going to get to do work for you, ask them, you know, what do they do with regard to their systems um, patching? How often do they upgrade their systems? How often do they have training and awareness? Um, how often do they do the backups? Definitely do that. And I'm still firmly of the belief that if you do frequent enough backups, uh, you, you shouldn't even have to consider doing 
or paying the ransoms because you'll have the data there and then if you keep it encrypted in storage you don't even have to risk having some cyber crit come in and actually take your data before they encrypt it and now all of a sudden you pay the ransom and they still have your data anyway so I think a short answer is to one part of your question do very strong vendor vetting for those that you contract to do portions of your business processing. I've got a couple of other thoughts. These are great questions. So the, the first as a general proposition is you cannot as a company outsource your liability as it relates to the law, right? However, you can minimize your economic exposure through contracts, right? Uh, indemnification clauses, uh, et cetera, where the third party may in fact um, you know, take on some of that risk. That said, the monsters like Google and Amazon, uh, they have disproportionate negotiation power against you, right? So keep that in mind. Uh, you may also want to look to your customer relationships at a contract level in terms of limitations of liability and the like. Again, that's a business decision and what those consequences are, are to be determined, you know, uh, with your team. Um, but that's something that you can look at as well. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, I've got a couple more questions. I, I know that we are approaching the end of the hour. Uh, because we are making this uh, webcast available online after this, I think we're gonna try and get through most of those questions. Uh, if we don't, don't panic, we will uh, shoot you an email and, and uh, get you an answer to your question. So with that said, let me hop back over to the Q&A platform. Um, one of the questions was, and this gets a little bit technical, um, but he says, uh, how do we vet router firmware, firmware upgrades such as Tomato iOS? And are there known backdoors into these Wi-Fi routers that have been exploited? Well, that's a great question. Keep in mind that there is no hardware that's 100% secure. So uh, yes, <laughs> there's always going to be vulnerabilities. The question is, has the vulnerability been discovered yet or not? And that's where I think it's important to check, uh, to go to certain places online that does this type of research and look at what they've found before you do the, the patching to those routers to see what experiences. You know, I mentioned Tom's hardware before. There are several others too, uh, and I have them bookmarked. I guess that would be something if you wanted me to, I could provide you with a list of those different types of sites. But um, there's a, a large number of sites that do research into very specific types of things, such as router hardware and so on. So it's good to keep your eye on those so you can help to vet them uh, before you download patches as you indicated. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, the next question is, um, it says, we hear about cyber insurance to help protect against these threats. Is this worth the investment? What does it cost and what companies are the most reputable? Well, I can tell you, uh, I've, I've got a little bit of experience on this. So our platform, Survive Cyber, actually embeds a $100,000 cyber insurance policy into it. So while you are a member of Survive Cyber, you have access to that. That said, um, that's actually a trend that you can keep track of. The, the estimates are that cyber insurance policies will be written at a very high rate compared to last year, year-over-year -year growth. Um, however, it's the Wild West. Number one, the insurance providers don't really know how to properly price the risk because uh, they don't have historical data. Um, so the pricing is all over the place. Um, and in addition to that, the coverages are all over the place. So I don't think it's a simple answer um, of, you know, what is appropriate. I think where you start, though, is, um, you know, you look at where your company is in terms of its risk. Uh, and try to quantify that risk to give you a sense of what kind of coverage you need. Uh, the big players are Access and AIG and, you know, the normal uh, cast of characters as well that you would expect uh, in, the, in the underwriting space. And if I could quickly add there to make sure you know what's being covered within any coverage that you're considering. Uh, because they are very different and oftentimes you need to make sure that you have all of your policies and procedures up to date and documented and that you've done risk assessments and that you can prove that you've done training. So that's something else to keep in mind with those. 
Great. The next question is also from our Q&A platform, and I think this is probably more for you, Alan. It says, with the elimination of net neutrality, what is the implication of what is going on with the new 5G world that we are going to be in? And what do we need to do to hopefully change the mind of the FCC? And Alan, I think you're muted. Let me see if I can fix that on my platform. Yep, got it. There we Thank go. Um, so net neutrality is really like a, not really a 5G issue necessarily. Um, it's just an internet issue and 5G is, you know, is, is a wireless proto mobile protocol for delivering internet and data. So um, there's nothing 5G specific about it. Um, as far as the FCC and um, net neutrality, I'm not an expert on that. Um, I would assume that uh, you probably need a change in administration. Um, I would assume that follows pretty partisan lines. Um, and there'd be more of a um, inclination to reinforce net neutrality um, you know, under a democratic administration if, if that's the goal you have. Um, but again, yeah, it's not really, it doesn't really connect actually to, to 5G except tangentially. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is asking, which is more secure, a Chrome operating system, Windows 10, Windows 7, which is the best for a small company to use for laptops? Well, much depends upon what you're using your laptops for, um, how intensive of processing you're going to be doing with them, what type of processing, and so on. I wouldn't go backwards in time to a Windows 7. Um, I know a lot of people think, oh, well, let's go back then because there's been some other flaws that have been introduced. But, you know, the latest Windows 10, if you keep up to date with that, um, you know, that that's pretty good but like I said earlier every operating system has some flaws or vulnerabilities it's just the extent to which those vulnerabilities are known but I I guess I wouldn't go backwards to old systems or operating systems yeah and I would also add it uh, they constantly leapfrog um, that said I'm pretty uh, I'm pretty hardcore about privacy so I actually use uh, a browser called Brave, which has a built-in Tor uh, browser. Uh, so your, you know, Chrome is tracking you through Google. Um, and in addition to that, I don't even use, oftentimes as my default search engine, I use DuckDuckGo, which also is committed to not tracking. Um, so those are some, some things to think about as well, just in terms of pure privacy of uh, what you're doing on your systems. Great. Uh, the next question we have is from Kevin, and he asks, should we consider buying new hardware with AMD chips and not Intel chips? Well, I guess I'll jump in on that one because I think right now, with regard to the evidence and what has been discovered with regard to the flaws, uh, at this point in time, I, if I were buying, I would go with the AMD chips in the hardware. Now, of course, there's plans for new chips to be released, and there's some plan for 2020, but if you're looking to get something in the near term, um, you know, you can learn from the big tech companies. If they're going with the AMD chips, uh, that would compel me to invest in those as opposed to the Intel, just because they, they've had a lot of people looking into those issues, so uh, they have a lot more researchers than I have on my team to, to determine what is the best chips to invest in. Great. The next question is from Doug Wiersba. Uh, the, he says, our business gets emails weekly advising if we don't send them money, gift codes, gift card codes, etc., they will attack our systems. We block them and delete the email, but it seems the following week we get another. Is there a way to better block these addresses? We use Outlook. Well, there's spam filters. I mean, certainly you can uh, implement a spam filter. A lot of those look at the domain addresses, oftentimes uh, the IP addresses 
that uh, they're coming from and they could tell certain parts of the world where IP addresses are notorious for sending out those types of messages, those will block them. So I would say look into getting a spam filter beyond the native Outlook capabilities and that will help you out a lot to keep those coming in. I, I deal with those too and you know there's always going to be some that are coming in though that's where your training and awareness raising helps so folks will realize ah uh, this is just some uh, some scammer trying to get at us and just delete it then. Great we have uh, just two more questions so we'll get to to those and then um, wrap things up in just a few moments. Uh, this is from Gary Kushner. He says, if we're currently using Chrome browser on an iPhone, what about using something like Privacy Pro's tracker protection or others that prevent tracking on all devices, including PCs, phones, and tablets? Well, those are good. Keep in mind that those do have overhead involved with them, so you will, um, you will notice, sometimes noticeable, sometimes not, depends on what all you have running on your system, but um, you know, they do help to keep tracking from occurring. You can also go in if you know how to go into your system and, and clear out your cache and also clear out the history, that helps as well. I mean, there's several different things you can do, but you know, that's good to, to use those tools. Great. And uh, Theo Nix has our final question. I think it's a good one to end on. He asks, if the biggest companies in the world, uh, including financial, financial institutions and governments, federal and state, are having breaches in their systems, how can small businesses possibly protect themselves? Not to mention the cost to even try to install a cybersecurity plan and system. So I think that um, you have to operate in today's day and age as if you have already been breached. Um, and that will change your mindset about how information is used, stored, and shared. So if you start from that perspective, I think that that's a good place. But that said, uh, small organizations in some respects have advantages to big ones, right? If we know that uh, a majority of breaches will also happen through employee mistakes, uh, your ability to educate a smaller work group um, is uh, probably easier than Pfizer's, right? Um, but a lot of the, 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 the action items that I put in my two slides at the end, um, they don't take a lot of money to do to start to move the needle. Um, and if you think about hackers, you know, the best analogy I saw was in a presentation, it, it's the path of least resistance. It's like a river meandering, right? The water tries to find the easiest victims. So if right next door to you is a company that has uh, you know, no firewalls, no password protections, no encryption. They're going after that over you. Um, so by just moving your needle, uh, puts you in a much better position than your peers. And I guess to address the, the comment about, you know, huge tech companies still getting hit, keep in mind it only takes one open pathway for a hacker to get in. And Google has literally tens of millions of probably endpoints that could create pathways into their network. So if a hacker finds just one of those open, they're going to try to uh, get in. So with a small company, you, you have much fewer pathways in. So that will help you out with regard to um, all those opportunities and pathways that you have to secure. You have fewer of them than a Google would. Great. Well, I think, like I said, that was a great one to end on. Let's kick it back over to Todd to wrap things up. Well, thank you all. I really appreciate the time and commitment. We went a little bit past two o'clock, but I think we shared some really good information with people. A little appreciate everyone staying with us to this point. Um, uh, thanks to our presenters and thanks to all the participants for staying on the line with us uh, this afternoon. Um, you can visit uh, this afternoon nsba.biz, our website, to access um, all those various resources uh, and expect to be hearing from us uh, more on all these issues as they develop. Um, there's a lot more I think we need to say and do about this. So thanks again. Uh, we'll be posting the whole webcast uh, on our site this afternoon. So you, if you want to know more, um, uh, please go there. Thanks again. Talk to you all soon.